Well, happy Easter again, everyone. It's great to see everyone dressed up this morning. <laughs> if you could open your Bibles to the Gospel of Luke, the Gospel of Luke, chapter 24. Chapter 24, I mentioned this at our Good Friday service two days ago, but we are, as you know, traveling through the Gospel of John as a church in general. We're actually going to spend the next couple of months looking at the final week of Jesus' life. John devotes a good portion of his Gospel to the final week of Jesus' life. And so I thought for this Easter weekend, we would look at the Gospel of Luke to hear Luke's account. And this morning, I want to dive into a particular resurrection story. There's a number of these stories throughout the Gospels. As, as you know, if you've, if you've read the Bible at all, you've heard different stories, times when he appeared to Mary and he appeared to Peter and the disciples and he appeared to the two disciples walking along the road. He appeared to many, many people. And so this is one of those stories. Now, just for the context and in case you're not as familiar, Jesus went to the cross on a Friday, we, we, we think it was a Friday in our current week construction. On Saturday, he was in the grave. His disciples were mourning. They were confused. They were frustrated. And on Sunday morning, a number of ladies went to the tomb to attempt to honor him in burial. They would have spices and so forth. But the tomb, they discovered, was empty. There was no one inside. An angel appeared to them, informing them that they should not be seeking Jesus Christ among the dead because he was now among the living. And yet in spite of that testimony, there was a great deal of skepticism and unbelief in the hearts of the disciples. They had a very difficult time believing. Even after a number of visual sightings of Jesus Christ, they had a hard time believing their eyes. Two of them had just walked with Jesus on a road and he had discussed with them the meaning behind his death and his resurrection. And then when they broke bread, their eyes were opened and they were given the ability to realize this is Jesus. This is our Savior risen from the dead. But even then, they gather here with the other disciples in Luke chapter 24, verse 36. And there continues to be skepticism. Could it be possible. The opening verses say that they're talking about these things. We can only imagine they're talking with each other and questioning each other. Are you sure? You're saying you, you think you saw Jesus. Are you sure you saw Jesus? Surely it's just that you wanted to see him. You couldn't have seen Jesus. I know because I saw Jesus die, John might say. There's no way. I saw the nails. I saw the spear thrust into his side. I saw his lifeless body. I saw him buried. Could not have been Jesus. And suddenly, an unexpected visitor arrives among them. Let's begin reading in verse 36 of chapter 24. As they were talking about these things, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace to you. But they were startled and frightened and thought they saw a spirit. And he said to them, Why are you troubled? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? See my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Touch me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they still disbelieved for joy and were marveling, he said to them, have you anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it before them. Then he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. 
Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. And behold... I am sending the promise of my Father upon you. But stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. My wife has uh, known me now for, I believe it's 16 years, 16 or yeah, 17 years, 16 years now. We've been married uh, over a decade now. Uh, but she still is surprised at my ability to uh, look for something and have it immediately before me and not see it. So despite all of those years, she continues to be amazed. I continue to impress her in that way. Um, she will say, can you go find such and such an item? Sure, I will go, I will look, I will stand in a certain spot, I will come back and say, it's not there. She will say, are you sure it's not there? Because I'm sure it is there, I'll go back. I will stand in a certain spot. I will look. I will not see anything like that item. I will come back. I'm telling you, it's just not there. I really looked this time. She will come. She will stand in the same spot. She will reach out her hand. She will pull it right out of the obvious spot and show it to me and look at me with a sense of surprise and consternation and unbelief. How is it possible that you are unable to see this having stood right here? She calls it boy's eyes. I, I don't, I, I, I'm reluctant to condemn my entire gender to my failings. <laughs> I certainly have a unique ability to see but not perceive. An ability that I share, thankfully, with these disciples. They also could see but not perceive. They could see, but did not believe. They could see, but not be transformed. Jesus is literally standing among them. They're talking about these things, likely given their doubt in this passage, they're questioning one another. They're questioning what they had seen before. He stands among them again. As they're talking about him, Jesus abruptly is there. And throughout this passage, they have this ability to see and yet remain clinging to their unbelief. The truth of a risen Christ has the potential to transform them, to transform their perspectives, to banish their doubts, to make all the difference, and yet they see, but they do not perceive. They see, but they are not transformed. And I have the same ability to know that Jesus rose from the dead, but not to be transformed by it, not to perceive what it means, not to be affected, not to be changed, to stand there in my awareness of his resurrection and yet be unaffected, unimpacted by what it means that Jesus rose from the dead. They saw and they did not perceive. I can know and yet not fully, functionally, truly believe what it means that he rose from the dead. That's why Luke wrote this passage to people that have boys' eyes looking at the truth of Jesus. And he's coming to us and saying, believe. Believe the life-transforming truth of a risen Savior. Believe. Believe. Don't just know about Believe, believe the life transforming truth of a risen Savior. And in order to get us from where we see but not perceive, he has to make two changes in our perspective. And he does that by walking through what happens to the disciples. First, the change from doubt to faith, and then the change from confusion to clarity. From doubt to faith, and then from confusion to clarity. You notice in this passage how stubbornly persistent the disciples are. Jesus comes, and, and let me just say this, because this has been affecting me this week. His opening phrase is packed with meaning. Peace to 
you. It has meaning for their immediate doubt and skepticism, but it has theological meaning, doesn't it? Peace to you. Shalom. Peace. Erene in the Greek. Peace. You know what that means? That means that there has been a cessation of warfare, a cessation of hostilities, a cessation of antagonism. Peace to you from the lips of the risen Christ is communicating more than just have a good day, good to see you, hope you're doing well. It means you are doing well if you understand what has just taken place. It means you're doing well at a cosmic level. It means you're doing well with God himself. Peace to you. And yet, they have a difficult time perceiving and receiving why peace from the lips of a risen Savior should transform their life. They are stubborn. And so he speaks to them just like he speaks to us. Why? Why do doubts arise in your heart? Why is your heart troubled? I think he could say the same thing to me on a weekly basis. Why do doubts arise in your heart? Why are your hearts troubled? The proof of the question is in the person speaking it. Why, says the risen Savior, do doubts arise in your heart? Why are your hearts troubled? It's comforting to me in some ways that these men were so persistent in their unbelief that even after he addresses them, even after he is standing in front of them, he feels it's necessary to invite them to feel his hands and his feet. That, that's comforting to me. These men weren't superheroes. They, they, they loved Jesus, but their cynicism was so strong that even when he was standing in front of them, they had a hard time. They would rather hold on to doubt than believe their own eyes. He's right in front of them. But they concoct this story and say, he's got to be a ghost. They would rather be creative in, in concocting doubt then express faith in what their eyes see. And that same creativity of doubt lingers today. I can come up with a million reasons other than that Jesus is alive and that I can trust him. Doubt is creative. So they say, this person that we're seeing looks real. He's got to be a ghost. This can't be. This is too good to be true. Therefore, I won't believe it. He's got to be a ghost. So he meets them in their moment of doubt. He says, come, feel, touch. And we can notice also the compassion of Jesus precisely at the body parts he invites them to feel, to handle, are the body parts that were pierced on the cross. Very important. Because he wants them to know this is not just a look-alike person. This is not just a similar-looking individual. No, 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 no. This is the same one who died. The same one who died is now alive in the flesh. The same one who was in the tomb is now standing in front of you. It speaks to any number of heresies over the years. It would say, well, it just appeared to be Jesus, and he just appeared to die. No, 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 no. Feel, feel. In, in the book of John, he says to Thomas, come, feel the wound in my side. Feel the nail prints in my hands and in my feet. Feel. Believe. Don't just see. Believe. I think he could say to us, don't just know about. Don't just accept in a general theoretical way. Believe. Believe the life-transforming truth of a risen Christ. Believe the same one who died for sinners rose from the dead. Believe. Their doubt remains stubborn. They want to believe. They are joyful in verse 41 and marveling even, but they are still lingering in unbelief. Isn't that true of our lives as well? Don't you just relate to the disciples in this passage? I want to believe, but it just feels safer to doubt. I believe in our culture, one of the greatest fears is the fear of naivety. One of the greatest fears. Rather anything than be fooled. Rather anything than be fooled. And somehow it's been accepted in our culture that doubt is a truth teller and faith is a liar. 
Doubt is a truth teller. So as long as you're doubting, you're on solid ground. As long as you're doubting, you're on solid ground. But the faith aspect, that is in murky quicksand. That's what the disciples, it's safer to doubt. As long as I retain a distance and skepticism, I'm on solid ground. Doubt is a solid place to be. Faith is a murky place to be. I, I read something this week about, uh, by Friedrich Nietzsche, who was describing his perspective of the Christian faith. He said, you know, Christians, basically, I'm paraphrasing him, Christians, what they want you to do, they want you to swim in the water and never entertain the idea that there could be a shore. They just want you to swim in the waters of faith and never entertain that there could be a shore over there. Don't even look over there to the shore. And in his mind, the, the shore is skepticism, doubt, reason, human logic, these kinds of things. Well, you, you realize the assumption is there, right? He's basically saying, well, no, no, doubt, doubt is solid. Faith is lacking. Faith is uncertain. Doubt is solid. Not believing in Jesus, that's believing the truth. Believing in Jesus, well, that's like swimming in the water and not being willing to look to the shore. You realize, well, but what if it's the case that Jesus actually rose from the dead? Then who's in the water? Every perspective, including doubt, is a statement of faith. It's a statement of belief. Nietzsche wants to say, well, no, if you, if you stand in this place of I don't believe in Jesus, I don't believe in God. Okay, you're on solid ground, you're safe. Unless you're wrong. Unless you're wrong. And then you're just as swimming around as the people you're looking at and claiming they're swimming around. Everybody's own position, they claim to be the position of truth. The point is, who's right? Who's right? Doubt is just as much an expression of faith that someone is right as the expression that Jesus is alive is an expression of faith that someone is right. Doubt is not more solid than belief in Jesus. For some reason, in our sinful hearts, it feels safer. It feels safer because I'd rather trust myself than entrust myself to someone else. That's what the disciples are feeling. I'd rather trust myself. I'd rather not entrust myself to someone else. And even when their own eyes could see him, they continue to linger in doubt. That's incredibly helpful for me because I struggle with doubt all the time. I struggle with doubt all the, I doubt, I don't live as though Jesus is actually risen from the dead. Just this last week, or a couple weeks ago, somebody brought an observation to me. A particular way that they, they just pointing out that I could have served them better, that I, I didn't serve them sufficiently, that I had failed in some way. Now, instead of just responding to that very helpful, very kind observation with conviction and applying the truth that Jesus died for my sins and he rose again and that I can now live a changed life and grow and that sin no longer needs to condemn me, but thank you for the helpful observation so that I can grow. Instead of just responding that way, I was battling thoughts of anger, self-defensiveness. Ah, oh, what, what do they think they know? Don't they appreciate all the other stuff I've done? And why can't they see all the things I do? Why do I have to point out the one thing I didn't do and not notice all the things I did do? Why, why, oh man, maybe I am that bad. Maybe I'm, oh, I, I'm just not serving. I, mean, I probably am not aware of all the ways I'm not serving people. I just wandered around that for a couple of days. What was I doing? Being just like the disciples? not being transformed by the truth that Jesus Christ rose from the dead? If Jesus rose from the dead, everything changes for a sinner that fails other sinners. That perspective should change everything. But I'm like them. I still disbelieve. I love it that Jesus comes all the way to the most practical level he po He's already showed them his hands and his feet. So he's, he just tries to be as practical as possible. Do you have anything to eat? How can I demonstrate I'm not a spirit? How about some fish? I, I, the, the earthiness of this passage is marvelous. It just shows the compassion of the Lord. I love that he's not harsh with them. That he doesn't rebuke them harshly. That he doesn't dismiss them from their office of apostle or disciple. How can you doubt I'm standing in front of you? You know there's going to be millions of believers over the centuries that will not have this level of evidence. 
and I'm going to ask them to believe? No, he, he comes even to these men who are seeing and not believing, and he comes to them with a practical example. Let me prove to you that I'm really alive. Watch me. Chew, swallow. It's me. I'm alive. I can eat. I'm not a ghost. I don't just appear to be here. I'm here. What a, what a marvelous expression of the compassion of the Savior as he tries to move them from doubt to faith so that they can apply the truth of the risen Savior. Lingering in doubt in any way, doubt about God's goodness, doubt about God's faithfulness, doubt about God's ability to forgive, doubt about what anything that Jesus has done, doubt in any way, living in doubt is living as though Jesus is still dead. Living in doubt is living as though Jesus is still dead. It reminds me of a story I heard about Martin Luther and his wife, Catherine. As the story goes, during one very difficult period, Luther was carrying many burdens and fighting many battles. Usually jolly and smiling, he was instead depressed and worried. Catherine endured this for days. One day, she met him at the door wearing a black mourning dress. Who died, the professor asked. God, said Catherine. You foolish thing, said Luther. Why this foolishness? It is true, she persisted. God must have died, or Dr. Luther would not be so sorrowful. <laughs> Doubt is living as though Jesus is still dead. Examine your own doubts right now, just for a moment. I've, I've been applying this passage to my soul this week. Where am I not receiving the good news of his peace? Where am I lingering in doubt? Where am I hanging on to self-defensiveness, self-protection, I'm alone in this world kind of thoughts? God is not with me. Maybe it's not true. Maybe I can't trust God. Where, where am I holding on to those thoughts rather than accepting peace be to you? I am risen indeed. Where are you accepting those thoughts? They feel safe. They feel solid. They feel sturdy. They are lying because Jesus is alive. So alive that he could eat fish and show them his hands and his feet where he had died for sinners. So alive that even cynical disciples were forced to believe in him, which is a comfort also to anyone who deals with the bigger questions of doubt. Maybe, maybe all of this is a fairy tale. Maybe all of this is a lie. Maybe none of Christianity is true. Be comforted by the story. Look, if there was any way that they could have doubted that Jesus was alive, don't you think these men would have chosen that option? Isn't that comforting to you? It's comforting that they didn't believe when they first heard. They were so doubtful that he could rise from the dead. They needed proof after proof after proof. They weren't looking to be fooled. If anything, they were determined not to be fooled, and he proved it to them anyway. Very encouraging for people that say, what if it's all a lie? Well, if there was any way of it being a lie, I think these guys would have found that way. And yet they believed anyway. From doubt to faith. True belief in a risen Christ must move us from doubt to faith. It must transform our perspective in our life. It must change us. It must change us because it is true. We must be transformed from doubt to faith. We also must be transformed from confusion to clarity. Jesus moves on from the fact of his resurrection to the meaning of it, from the proof that he is alive to the plan of why he did what he did over the last three days. 
He begins to explain to them that this was not just a happy coincidence that he rose from the dead. Just like it wasn't a happy or sad, rather, day when he was taken to the cross. It was not mere fate that led Jesus to the cross and mere circumstance that brought him up from the tomb. No, he says, no, 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 no. You have to understand. You have to move from vague confusion about who I am and what I was doing to clarity. Because unless you have clarity about the meaning and the purpose, Person behind the resurrection and the death of Christ, you will not be transformed by the truth of it. So he says, these are my words that I spoke to you. Verse 44, while I was still with you. Remember, I was still with you. He's drawing their minds back. I was still with you. And remember, I, I told you everything that would happen, that the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. So he's, he's going back over a thousand years, and he's saying, look, these writings predicted what would happen. This was no accident. This wasn't mere happenstance. I didn't just happen to go to the cross. I am not just some other human noble victim. I am not someone who died a noble death and is an example. No, this was God's plan all along. Your scriptures testified that the Messiah would have to suffer. The servant of the Lord would be crushed by God in the place of sinners. The lamb would be sacrificed. Your own institutions and teaching and scriptures declared that the Son of Man would come who sits at God's right hand. Your scriptures declared that a righteous servant would be abandoned by his followers, that the shepherd would be struck, that the sheep would be scattered, that a servant of the Lord would declare he'd been forsaken of God in spite of his righteousness. Your scriptures declared that this was going to happen. He opens their minds. Wouldn't you have loved to be there for that sermon? Didn't God say that the one who would crush the serpent would be bitten by the serpent in the heel? Somehow he would be wounded, but he would succeed. Didn't Isaiah say that the servant of the Lord would be crushed in place of sinners? Didn't David say, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool? Didn't Moses say that there must be a sacrifice for sin because without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins? Wasn't that clear in Leviticus? Didn't God say all of these things? And can you not see their fulfillment now? Didn't Joseph, being one of the brothers, yet abandoned by his brothers, go into the dark place, literally could have been of death, and then was raised out of that to become the savior of his entire family? Don't you see the patterns, brothers? Don't you see what God was preparing you to see all along? Come from confusion to clarity. Look and see. It's right in front of you. It's right in front of you. It's right there. You've been reading the right scriptures, but you haven't been seeing the meaning. This resurrection was God's plan all along. Just like the cross, God's plan all along. Was it not written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead. And the result of that, that repentance and forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. Was it not written that this must take place so that God's plan of salvation could take place for every tribe and every nation? Did God not say to Abraham that through his offspring he would become a blessing to every nation? How did you think that would come about as long as God is holy and people are sinful unless there is a perfect sacrifice that defeats the power of death, rises from the grave, and demonstrates that God has defeated sin once and for all? It is possible, I suppose, to believe in the fact of the resurrection and to not see the meaning of Jesus fulfilling God's plan of salvation. Especially today with 
medical marvels and even speculation in sci-fi movies about cryogenics and in some sense bringing people back through resuscitation, those kinds of things. It's possible that our minds could be numbed to the miracle of true resurrection. It's possible. And that accepting that as a fact that Jesus rose from the dead, we would not be transformed by the meaning of it. The meaning of Jesus' resurrection from the dead is that all the blessings of the gospel described in the scriptures are true, just as true as his life is. As surely as Jesus rose from the dead, forgiveness of sins can be offered by God. As surely as Jesus rose from the dead, it was God's plan that Christ should suffer in the place of sinners. As surely as Jesus rose from the dead, it was God's plan that every tribe and every nation could have those who would respond to Jesus as their Savior. As surely as Jesus rose from the dead, his followers would receive the promise of the Holy Spirit, would be clothed with power, the timid would become bold, the gospel would be preached, and people and men and women from every tribe and nation would see that Jesus is the Messiah, would confess their sins, and would come to know him as Savior and Lord. As surely as Jesus rose from the dead, this creation would be transformed from death to life, from old to new. The garden would be restored, and everyone who believes in Jesus would be with God forever. As surely as Jesus rose from the dead, every gospel blessing is yes and amen in him. Charles Spurgeon says, the blessings of the gospel are substantial facts and not mere theological opinions. As the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ from the dead was a plain, visible matter of fact, so are the pardon of sin. That's the connection Jesus is making here. As surely as you see me, just that surely, there is the blessings of the gospel available to you. So are the pardon of sin and the salvation of the soul matters of actual experience and not the creatures of religious imagination. We need this clarity. If if we're really going to be changed, transformed, if we're really going to perceive the resurrection that is right in front of us and understand the impact of it, we need to see this connection. Not just the fact that he rose, but the reason why he died and the implications of that resurrection from that death. Important clarification I think we need to make. Sometimes when we talk about the resurrection of Jesus, sometimes we, we tend to think of it uh, maybe similar to a, a person who by sheer strength forced himself out of a prison. And, and in one sense, I appreciate that. Jesus did defeat the power of death and there's a sort of a, a power imagery. But there's another way that could, that could v- kind of uh, blur what really happened what took place. I remember when I was uh, younger, um, a certain Christian artist described the resurrection in terms of a boxing match between the devil and Jesus, and, and Jesus goes down, and there's a count, you know, and then unexpectedly he gets up off the mat and wins, you know, that was the way they described it. Okay, I mean, I understand what we're trying to do there, we're trying to yay Jesus, but that kind of indicates that just by sheer physical strength, Jesus got out of the grave, which other people couldn't do. That, we could really miss a really important part about that. Jesus didn't come out of the grave because he was stronger than the grave. He came out of death because death is conditional. And Jesus met the condition. If I could use the same imagery, Jesus didn't break the bars of death having died and Unlike every other person who has died, he was strong enough to break those bars. No. By dying as an innocent victim, Jesus unlocked death. The gate swung open that none other could open because every other death was deserved. And every other death finding itself in that prison of judgment found a gate that was locked by their own sin and God's holiness that they could never unlock until now. Jesus in his death paid the condition, turned the key of the curse of death so that that prison cell now has an open door for all those who are in Jesus. So you understand how sometimes when we describe 
him breaking out, I, I feel like maybe we miss it. Maybe we could miss the personal benefit we have. It's not as though Jesus in that same power is going to reach down and break us out of that death once we die. No, no, no. Because we're in Christ, that door is permanently open for all who are in him. Now, physically, we might walk into the room when we close our eyes in death, but that room for us has become the doorway into glory. The door of death is permanently opened. It's not just busted open. It's unlocked. It has no power to contain anymore for those who are in Jesus. Leon Morris says, the cross is the victory. The resurrection is the triumph. The resurrection is the public display of the victory, the triumph of the crucified one. Do you see how that brings an even greater level of assurance, an even greater level of confidence? Because you are in Jesus, the gate that is death and the lock that is the curse of sin has been permanently opened. That's why Jesus says, I have the keys to death in Hades. Or as John Piper brilliantly uses a similar analogy. The keys to death were hung on the inside of Christ's tomb. Having gone there, he has them forever and for everyone who believes in him. To receive forgiveness in him is to have all of the rights over death that Christ has. To see death as merely a sleeping in which we awake in glory. To see the curse as fulfilled, the lock as opened. To expect and depend on the full power of the Holy Spirit, which he describes here as the promise of the Father, is based on the fact that Jesus in dying broke the curse and brought us back into full fellowship with God even, amazingly, the kind of fellowship he has with his father. Here's the meaning of Easter Sunday for every Christian. God has forgiven your sins in Christ, and you have been made his ambassadors to offer salvation in Christ to every person around you, empowered by the Holy Spirit. Here's the meaning. If you're a Christian, that means you believe in the one who turned the key of death by his death and who walked out of the grave so that in him you also have that same access and freedom. That's the meaning of believing. Now how many of us stand in front of Easter Sunday and every day seeing but not perceiving? How many of us have moments where we're sinful? We know Jesus rose from the dead, but we're not grasping that truth and applying it. How many of us feel condemned about our failures? We're seeing, we know Jesus rose from the dead, but we're not grasping that truth and applying it to the fact that in his resurrection, the Father was declaring his death sufficient, that Jesus would not have walked out of that grave if grave could still hold him. But since the curse was paid, remember, Jesus didn't die for his own sin. He had no sin. So he could not have walked out of the grave if his payment for our sin was insufficient. He had no sin in the first place. It was only because the payment for our sin was sufficient that he could walk out of the grave. God imputed not his own sin, our sin to him. It was our sin that was declared fulfilled when Jesus walked out of the grave. It was our guilt that God declared paid in full when Jesus walked out of the tomb. It was our failures that Jesus declared sufficiently exhausted in wrath, now welcome into glory. We must see and perceive and respond when we have that moment of sin, when we have that moment of doubt, when we have that moment of questioning, Jesus rose from the dead. Jesus rose from the dead, which means his death was accepted by God the Father, that in him we now rise, that in him our sins are fully paid and forgiven. Death no longer has any curse, because if it did, oh, my sins surely would have kept him in that prison. My imputed sins would surely have left him there, except God accepted his sacrifice and said, come out. And when he said come out to Jesus, since our record was imputed to him, he was saying come out to us. 
come out of the tomb. John Payne. Matthew Watkin, Ricky Ramos, Robert Fellner, Tulsi McFerrin, come out of the condemnation and the curse and the death because when God saw Jesus in his divine goodness, he chose to link us with him. And as surely as he rose, we rose in him. Here's the meaning of Easter Sunday for the non-Christian. Come out. Come out of the grave. Come out of the cursed state of abandonment and forsakenness of close relationship with the Lord. Come out of that place. Come out because the same Father who looks on you and sees your sin invites you to receive the covering righteousness of his Son. He no longer will view you as a judge, but as a welcoming father. Come out of that grave. Come out of that place where your sins have kept you away from your God. Come to him. Because if you believe in Jesus, just like Jesus walked out of that grave, you can walk out of your current place of alienation from the Lord. Come out. Come out. Why stay in a prison cell that has been opened by one who offers you the key? Come out of the grave, come out of condemnation, come out of brokenness and a sense that you are not good with God. Come out of that place and come into the place where God is your father, where Jesus is your savior, where all of the blessings of heaven are given to you with free, abundant generosity in spite of your sin because your sin has been paid for in him. No amount of sin is so great that Christ's death didn't pay for it. So give your sin and your guilt to him and come out of your state of condemnation and into the peace with God that he offers to you. J.C. Ryle says this, had he never come forth from the prison of the grave, how could we ever have been sure that our ransom had been fully paid? Had he never risen from his conflict with the last enemy, how could we have felt confident that he has overcome the power of death from the devil? But thanks be unto God, we are not left in doubt. The Lord Jesus really rose again for our justification. Let us take our doubts and fears to the empty tomb and bury them there because Jesus is no longer there but in heaven. Let us take our wavering assurance, our uncertain hearts to the empty tomb and bury them there because Jesus is no longer there but in heaven. Let us take our fight against sin and the hopelessness that comes from it to the empty tomb and remind those lingering struggles that in his finished work, we have hope of permanent change, permanent transfer transformation gradually now and eventually in perfection when we see him face to face. Let us open our eyes not just see, but perceive and be changed by the good news that the crucified Messiah is risen. Let me pray. I'd like to invite Rob and the band up. We're going to sing one song before we close. Lord Jesus, we rejoice in you. We rejoice in your life in your victory over the grave we rejoice in the completion of your finished work the completion of it on the cross and the assurance we have of that completion through your resurrection lord i pray for anyone here who does not know you who does not know you as savior lord let them flee from their current state of alienation and enmity towards you 
and their eventual state of being forsaken of you, Lord, and let them draw near to you in saving faith and call you Savior and Lord. And Lord, for all of us who have done that, let us rejoice now in the glory of the one who saved us. Let us declare your name, Lord, with passion and faith and joy. May you be crowned with many crowns, Lord Jesus, the Lamb of God, slain and risen for us. In your name now we pray and we sing. Thank you.